the Inside Scoop Virginia, all the news Virginians want to know. Now here's the host of Inside Scoop Virginia, George Burke. Welcome to tonight's show. My guest is Jerry Connolly, who really needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, he's chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. He's in his second full term, a uh, former Mason District Supervisor, a uh, former staffer on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He got his bachelor's degree at Mary Knoll and his master's degree, as we would say, at Habit. Jerry, uh, welcome to the show. Great to you're, be here, George. You're the, uh, the fourth candidate in this congressional race that I've had on the show. We've had on Laurie Alexander, we've had on Leslie Byrne, we've had on Doug Denenny, and you get to play cleanup. Uh, I do hope to have you back with uh, the rest of the candidates uh, after the filing date, and we hope to do a debate here at some point between now and the June 10th primary. Uh, Jerry is running for Congress in the 11th District. Um, the primary is June 10th. Uh, I, for one, suspect it'll be a very spirited campaign, and it's already starting to pick up a little bit. So let's get right into it. Why are you running? Well, George, you know, I've watched uh, the Bush administration sort of unfold these last seven years. And uh, as a local government official, um, I've seen a dysfunctional government at the federal level. It just doesn't work. And we saw that in very dramatic ways um, in the federal response to Katrina, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Um, you know, I head up the largest government in Virginia, and it's a government that wins national awards for its effectiveness. So I, I'm really committed to, you know, the notion that government ought to work. Uh, that's the contract. We pay our taxes, and we expect government to be there when we need it. And, um, and I think we, we need people with that kind of practical experience. Uh, in the United States Congress who will bring that demand, that expectation to the Congress and to the federal agencies. Secondly, uh, you know, my, I have 20 years of foreign policy experience. I spent 10 of those years on the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I traveled over 76 countries. That foreign policy background is also critical because, again, another legacy of the Bush administration is that U.S. credibility and respectability around the world is probably at low ebb. And I think, you know, we're really going to have to clean up uh, the mess we're going to inherit from George Bush. And I want to work with a new Democratic president, with a new Democratic Congress, to make a contribution in both of those fronts. The, um, uh, in recent years, we've seen the Democrats take back both the House and Senate. Uh, they have a relatively slim majority in the House at this point. And, and the Senate, they could use more because they need to, it seems today you need two-thirds vote on everything in the Senate right. to get anything to stick, so to speak. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a good year for Democrats. Uh, there are 25, 26, I believe, uh, seats where Republicans are retiring uh, or for other reasons have chosen not to run. Uh, some of those seats are going to be a Democratic pickup. I, for one, believe, and some of the pundits believe, that this 11th district seat is going to be front and center in this uh, upcoming campaign. Uh, from your perspective, how is the campaign going at this point? Well, from our point of view, it's going very well. Uh, we've had over 60 uh, elected Democrats and party officials endorse our candidacy. That's more than twice uh, any of the other three opponents. Uh, we're on target. Uh, our big fundraiser is St. Patrick's Day. And by the end of March, uh, for the March filing date, uh, we anticipate that uh, we'll be reporting uh, north of uh, half a million dollars raised in uh, the last two and a half months. Uh, we've done a poll that we've released that shows that we start the campaign with a better than a 20-point lead over my nearest uh, opponent. Uh, so we're very gratified at the reaction uh, we're getting from, uh, from supporters all across the district uh, who really want to be part of this effort uh, and who want to make sure we, we take back the seat. And, and I think electability is going to play a very big role uh, as this campaign unfolds. Who is the more electable candidate? Uh, if we really want to win the seat and hold it. Let's get down to brass tacks. There are four candidates in the race, uh, but I make no bones about it. And as you know, I'm chair of the 11th Congressional District Committee. Uh, there's really two tiers of candidates here. There's yourself and Leslie Byrne, and then you have Doug Denany, who I think in the future will make a good candidate. He's pretty green right now. And Laurie Alexander, who's totally new to the process. Um, how do you navigate through this crowded field and win the primary? 
Well, I, I, you know, hopefully uh, one's record counts, uh, and I believe it does. Uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons I'm ahead uh, in, in our poll uh, rather considerably, because I think people are familiar with my record of getting things done, uh, results that really matter. Uh, and I think that counts for a lot. And, and that kind of reputation is exactly, it seems to me, what the voters of the 11th Congressional District, especially the Democratic primary voters, want to see in their next congressperson. Uh, and so I think that resonates well with the Democratic electorate, and I believe it will also resonate well uh, in the November 4th election. The, um, uh, a lot of the pundits say, well, all the action's going to be in the primary, and the general election's going to be in a cakewalk, a cakewalk for the Democrat. Well, I look at the Republican. He's already been endorsed by Tom Davis, the incumbent. Uh, and the last time I looked, he had about $700,000 in the bank, half of it his own money. He obviously has some wealth. Uh, but that doesn't appear to be a cakewalk to me. I mean, certainly this district is trending Democratic. There's no doubt. But I think this guy could be more of an opponent than anyone realizes at this point. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think uh, I know that one of my major opponents uh, in that top tier uh, would have Democrats believe that whoever wins the Democratic nomination is going to automatically win the election because this district has turned blue. Well, I wish that were true. But this district was districted to be a Republican district. Mm -hmm. And although the demographics are changing and changing favorably for Democrats. It is not at all going to be a cakewalk. Uh, the Republican, the likely Republican nominee, it, it can self-finance. He's already put in three or four hundred thousand dollars of his own money, uh, has a war chest well north of seven hundred thousand already. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't report upwards of a million dollars on the March 31 filing deadline. This is going to be a formidable opponent. And the Republicans are not going to sit by and idly watch the Democrats simply walk into the seat. While they do have a lot of seats to defend, this is a critical one. It's in, in the nation's capital. It's been a Republican seat for 14 years. The Democrats couldn't hold the seat when they won it for one term, uh, when it was districted, I might add, to be a Democratic seat. Uh, and they're going to throw everything they can, by way of resources, uh, into defending the seat. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's why electability is so important. Who has a history of winning and who does not? Uh, I've won five elections in a row uh, in competitive territory. Um, two of those elections were countywide representing over a million people. And, uh, and, and so when you can demonstrate that you're, you're, you're competitive in that arena, um, I think that's going to count for something when uh, Democrats go to the polls on June 10th. Do you think it helps you that uh, approximately, maybe even slightly more than two-thirds of the district is in Fairfax County? Sure. But, but we're also going to compete vigorously in, in Prince William County. Mm -hmm. You know, Prince William County is our neighboring jurisdiction. Um, I've worked a lot with Prince William County officials over the years uh, at the Virginia Association of Counties and on regional boards and commissions on regional issues that matter to us, uh, environmental issues, transportation issues, and the like. And, and that may be why uh, almost all of the elected Democrats in Prince William County have endorsed my candidacy. Uh, working with people toward regional solutions, working well with others, uh, even reaching across the aisle to try to get solutions to problems as opposed to uh, you know, rhetorical flourishes that don't always have a lot of uh, real life uh, impact or meaning to citizens. I want to uh, spend some time on the issues with you, but I'm trying to get through some of the politics first. Um, and I also want to remind the viewers, if you would like to talk to Jerry Connolly tonight, I'm sure there's a couple of you who do, 571-749-1166 is our number. The, uh, what do you think will be the defining issues of this campaign? I don't want to go into great detail. We've got uh, three quarters of an hour where we'll discuss the details. But uh, in this specific, in the 11th District, you know, certainly many of the issues are the same across the country. Uh, and, I, and we certainly want to hear about those. But I want your view on what is the defining, what are the defining issues? And I'm sure there's more than one. Well, you know, there are a lot of issues we're going to have to be addressing. Certainly, the economic uh, turn of events, uh, we're now, I think, probably in a recession. Obviously, it's going to matter to voters. Buffett. Yeah. Um, obviously, <laughs> going to matter a lot to, to voters as they watch the deterioration of that economy and, and they watch life savings and 401ks and pensions mm -hmm. deteriorate along with them. Um, obviously health care, obviously the war in Iraq. But I really think that the defining issue here is who brings the most to the table uh, by way of experience and results 
uh, that we want to send to Congress to represent us. And then the second thing I think that's really important is what I've already said, electability. And who is the likelier candidate Democratic nom uh, as a Democratic nominee to in fact win and hold the seat? We have a highly educated electorate in the 11th. Uh, it is the most highest in terms of education levels or, or among the top five anyway, depending on who you talk to. Uh, it is one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, congressional district in the country. And I think because of our proximity to the District of Columbia and to Capitol Hill and how many of us at one time or another have actually worked on the Hill or, or are involved in government in one way or another, we, uh, empty rhetoric doesn't go very far in the 11th District. Uh, people do listen, people do understand the issues, and I think that because of that, they expect a, a, a bit higher level of debate. Um, are you prepared uh, to, um, you know, I know there's going to be a lot of forums taking place over the uh, next couple of months, uh, but the 11th District in uh, concert with Prince William, with Fairfax City, and with the county, with Fairfax County, uh, we hope to put together a series of two, hopefully three debates, one in each jurisdiction. And uh, we're going to reach out to all those candidates who go through the petition process, which will be coming up later this month, uh, and we'll make them bona fide candidates in this process. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will, in fact, agree to participate in those as well. Absolutely. And uh, it'll be monumental in terms of trying to find dates where I can get all of you uh, round it up at the same time, but we will certainly uh, do our best to do that. Let's talk about the economy. We've got about a minute and a half uh, left before the break, and, and we'll resume it. Uh, but as I referred to earlier, Warren Buffett made no bones about it. We are in a recession. Meanwhile, George Bush acts like we're not even close to a recession. I mean, he's still living in a dream world. Where, um, where, uh, uh, where do we need to go? What do we need to do to resolve this? Well, uh, and I know it's a long-term process. I don't think we've reached bottom by any means yet. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Bush years have been very uneven years from an economic point of view. And, um, you know, we're, we're, what's happened, of course, is the subprime mortgage crisis uh, allowed that bubble to burst. And when it did, an awful lot of the... Uh, residential real estate market in this country and the financial institutions that back that up have been affected by that bow wave. Uh, I think the denial of the Bush administration uh, about where we are is probably unhelpful. Uh, you know, taxpayer citizens can see every day on their television what's happening in the stock market, what's happening to international markets. Uh, you know, the, the Bear Stern uh, crisis and, and the bailout by the Federal Reserve of Bear Stern, one of the oldest, most prestigious uh, firms on Wall Street is, is an alarm bell, uh, if there ever was one. And uh, clearly, uh, the United States Congress and the next administration are going to have to respond to this, it seems to me, in, in a lot of different ways. Now, they were able to put together a bipartisan economic stimulus package, but, but that's only one step. We, uh, we have to take a break, but uh, I want to get back to the economy afterwards, and we have a phone call. Hang on with us. We'll be back in two minutes. My guest today is Jerry Connolly. Democratic candidate for Congress in the 11th District of Virginia. How far would you go to help someone? Would you go to the end of your driveway? Would you cross a street? Would you cross an ocean? to a place 6,000 miles from home? And how long would you go? Would you go for a week, a month, a year? Would you go for two years? Would you go if you could use your knowledge to teach someone, and in the process, maybe learn something yourself? Life is calling. How far will you go? Peace Corps. Jay, don't forget your helmet. Will do. Not a helmet. Your bike helmet. Oh, okay. 
Hi, I'm James Thrash with the Washington Redskins. On the football field, a helmet is an important piece of equipment. I also wear another helmet that's just as important, a bike helmet. It's the most important piece of equipment you'll have the next time you're out on your bike. Wear yours and make sure your kids do too. Safety first with the skins. Monica and her friends want you to know that you should never get near a dog when it is eating, playing with a favorite toy, or sleeping. It's really important to make time for exercise and games and keep your dog's vaccines up to date. Never leave a dog in a small, confined space. This can make dogs aggressive like Monica. If you follow this advice, <coughs> you and your dog can play safely and happily together. Now back to the Inside Scoop for Jim. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, George Burke. Welcome back. My guest today is Jerry Connolly, chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, candidate for Congress in Virginia's 11th District. Jerry, you must have said something because I'm looking at my board here and I already have two phone calls backed up, so we're going to have to put the economy on hold for a Let's minute. Let's go to the phone. I think the first one's ironic. It's Mrs. Byrne from Oakton. Mrs. Byrne, how are you? Good afternoon. You got a question for Jerry? I do. I'd like to know the three biggest issues facing us um, now, today, that you will address when you're in Congress. And I realize that some of these are larger and will be facing our children and grandchildren. Well, thank you, Mrs. Byrne. I, I, I think if I were to identify three, they are, uh, they are obviously the economy, uh, the dysfunctionality of the federal government, the fact that it doesn't always work. Uh, Katrina is a great example. We've got to clean up uh, the federal mess left behind by the Bush administration and, 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 and insist the federal government work. And then thirdly, uh, we of course have the problem uh, of U.S. involvement in Iraq. We're fighting two wars now, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. The damage done in the Bush years by cowboy diplomacy to U.S. reputation and credibility abroad has to be repaired. Uh, for the sake of national security, that's a national security issue too. So uh, I think I'd list those sort of as three broad categories. Obviously, there are lots of discrete issues that have to be addressed uh, in the coming years by the United States Congress. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope he answered your question. Now we're going to move to a second call in a minute. We will have a call from Kathleen in Fairfax will be coming to us, but uh, I don't know if she's quite ready yet. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for you. Right. I'm raising um, three children in Fairfax County, and I'm disturbed by No Child Left Behind and its impact on the schools. How specifically has No Child Left Behind affected Fairfax County, and what would you do to change it? That's a great question. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, no Child... No Child Left Behind is a great example of federal good intentions gone awry. Uh, and it's because a, a bunch of legislators obviously don't have any practical experience in implementing the kind of legislation they're passing. No Child Left Behind has cost Fairfax taxpayers at least $17 million a year to implement. $17 million the federal government requires us to pay. That's called an unfunded mandate. And I would say probably 6 or $7 million in our neighbor, Prince William County. Um, in addition, the law is applied very rigidly, so it doesn't take into account the kind of diverse population we have where not everybody is equally proficient in the English language when they start. The nice thing about our school systems is that by, after two or three years, those kids are proficient in English and are easily competitive with their counterparts. But we've got to have the time and the flexibility to help them get to that level playing field. The federal government won't give us that flexibility. Frankly, my view is if we can't make that law more workable, if we can't make sure the federal government funds its own mandate, uh, and if we can't get that flexibility local governments need, I can't in good conscience support reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, even though I'm a big advocate for a accountability. But the way that law is structured, it's frankly hurting school districts all across the country and certainly here in Northern Virginia. It often makes people teach to the test instead exactly. of teaching them. And instead of educating them. And as someone with a Jesuit education, you fully understand the, the art of educating. Uh, our viewers may not realize it, but we have a bit of a studio audience tonight. And one of the guests in the studio 
uh, during the break had a specific question that I'll pose to you now, Jerry. Um, what kind of tone are you hoping for in this primary campaign? You know, hopefully, since this is among fellow Democrats in a Democratic primary, and there are four of us in this race, we can have a fairly, uh, a fairly vigorous uh, debate and discussion about the issues, about our qualifications, and about electability. Um, what I hope does not happen is that we have the kind of personal vitriol and the ad hominem attacks that have characterized many other races across the country. I hope we Democrats uh, took enormous umbrage, correctly so, when the Republicans swift voted our nominee four years ago, John Kerry. Uh, certainly I hope we won't have any tolerance for a fellow Democrat swift voting anybody in the Democratic primary. Uh, between now and June 10th, and I hope if that happens, we call them on it. Let's um, go back to the economy. We talked a bit about the subprime mortgages, and I don't think the 11th District is immune to that either. No. I mean, we're certainly seeing some problems in Prince William, and it is uh, a problem that is affecting those with wealth as well as those who may be living a little closer to the margins on their mortgages. Uh, you know, property values have dropped a little bit. I don't think we've seen the kind of drops in Fairfax uh, that some other parts of the country, particularly the Midwest, have seen. Uh, but a lot of people are mortgaged to the hilt on their Excellent. homes. And too many people use their homes as piggy banks for too long. And, and that is all coming to roost. But there are certainly other issues. I mean, we are... Uh, well, G George, if I can interrupt you, let me, let me just say, even in Fairfax, just to give you a dramatic statistic, two years ago in all of Fairfax County, and we have about mm, 374,000 properties, mm -hmm. parcels of land that are owned. Um, we had, in all of Fairfax County two years ago, 198 foreclosures. This last year, it's approaching 5,000. Boy, that's a huge difference. And, and you're seeing it in Prince William County as well. And you're right that the, the drop in residential property value is relatively modest compared to some of our neighbors. In Fairfax, it's about 3.38%. But in Prince William County, it's double digit. So um, it's unevenly felt in our region, but in the, in the uh, fast growing outer suburbs in Prince William County and Loudoun County that experience the high, highest growth, they're also experiencing the hardest hit. Hardest rates. Um, when we're talking about the economy, there are just so many pieces of it. You know, I don't think President Bush has given us a balanced budget uh, to start with, for Congress to start with in eight years. Not that Congress has done a great job of balancing it uh, recently themselves, uh, but their starting point is deficit spending. Uh, the trade deficit continues to, to grow. Uh, where the dollar is in the toilet in Europe compared to the euro and compared to the yen and some of the other currencies. Uh, there are a lot of issues that all seem to be coming to a head at once. If you're elected to Congress, how will you next year? I understand, obviously, a member of Congress is one of 435, and, and it, it's a collective action that has to be taken. Uh, but what will you be saying? What will be your voice in Congress and your message to the leadership in Congress on how we dig ourselves out of this morass? Well, like, this is a, another example where I think having worked in local government so long, uh, having led the largest local government in Virginia, we're required to balance our budget every year. I don't got a choice. So we have to make those tough decisions. And I think, you know, sound fiscal stewardship is really important even at the federal level. You're absolutely right. George Bush this year, a, allegedly a conservative Republican, proposed a budget, proposed, at, you know, from the beginning, a budget with a $407 billion deficit. He's added trillions of dollars to the national debt. In fact, we've accumulated probably more debt on his watch than the entire history of the United States since George Washington combined. And that's putting, going to put an enormous burden of debt responsibility on our kids and on their kids, uh, future generations. So looking at a, you know, a, a fiscally prudent approach to federal management and federal budgeting, uh, and also you know, looking at things Bush has left us. For example, do we really want to make the Bush tax cuts especially for the, uh, for the very wealthy, permanent. Um, his tax cuts could cost us well over a half a trillion dollars of additional revenue over the next 10 years. I think that's irresponsible, especially with an economy, as you said, that is tanking and where the dollar is at record lows against the, the Japanese yen and the uh, European euro, uh, where trade deficits are ballooning. 
uh, and where we're facing clearly recessionary pressures here at home? The, uh, it's it's going to be a major uphill battle. We have another call from Jack from Fairfax. Jack, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm from a union family. Would you uh, tell me some of the things you've done as chairman to help labor unions and working people? Yes. Thank you, Jack. Um, I was very proud of the fact that I'm the first chairman of Fairfax County uh, to get the government to adopt a living wage, which was one of the, the cornerstones, I think, of organized labor uh, in its attempts to try to uh, buttress uh, the economic well-being of working men and women in, in our community. Um, I also worked with other unions on, um, uh, for example, trying to protect uh, workers who are in the, in the food business uh, from predatory uh, behavior by outside big box kinds of uh, institutions and we adopted an amendment to our ordinance both protecting neighborhoods and frankly protecting the rights of working men and women uh, to a fair, uh, fair salary and a fair wage uh, in Fairfax County. Uh, we have worked, I have worked over the years with the police union, with the sheriff's deputies union, with the firefighter union uh, to try to make sure that compensation and benefits are fair to our public safety workers especially. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of that record. I believe that uh, we'll probably have a lot of support uh, from unions uh, as this campaign unfolds. We've worked very closely with the teachers in both the Fairfax Education Association and with the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, to try to make sure that there are more resources for teachers so that the men and women who are in front of our children in classrooms to whom we entrust our kids, you know, are well compensated at a professional level. And we're making a lot of progress on that too, working with the teachers unions. Hope that answered your question, Jack. The, uh, uh, just one comment on my part, as you know, I worked many years for the International Association of Firefighters. Uh, and I was always proud to tell people I came from Fairfax County because the fire department is uh, one of the best in the country. Uh, it's one of the urban search and rescue teams. Absolutely. Uh, one of two in the nation that actually goes overseas, is sent overseas mm -hmm. by the federal government. Miami Dade's the other. Uh, it's been well run, it's been well managed. It has a strong union, even in a state like Virginia, which is not a strong union state. I think we all understand that. Uh, but they've done, uh, you know, they, they have a reputation that is not only national but international. Uh, in scope. We are uh, going to take a break. Uh, we've got some calls coming in. You're a popular guy today, Jerry. Uh, so we will be back in two minutes. Hang in there with us. I'm George Burke and you're watching Inside Scoop Virginia. serves a sentence with you. I'm Bob Costas and I've been broadcasting sports for a long time. Much of what I do is ad-libbed, but still one of the most important aspects of my job is being able to write. Narrations, essays, commentaries, it's essential to express those thoughts and concepts clearly and concisely. Good writing is essential for almost any career. And with today's advanced technology, the National Commission on Writing reports that the need to write well has never been more important. Writing is everybody's business. Sure, my neighbors Gene and Louise, they may be superheroes with superpowers, but that doesn't make them so super at saving energy and money. Honey! I may not be able to harness the power of the elements, but I save significant cash and help the environment with appliances, electronics, and windows featuring the Energy Star label. So discover your own energy-saving superpowers. Go to ASE.org slash consumers. Mom, Dad's making fun too again. Now 
back to the Inside Scoop Virginia. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, George Burke. Welcome back. Uh, we're at the halfway mark of our program. My guest tonight is Jerry Connolly, running for Congress in the 11th District as a Democrat. We have a primary on June 10th. I hope you'll all vote. I hope you're paying attention. We've had all of the candidates on. Jerry is the fourth candidate to be on, and uh, uh, you'll see more of them between now and June 10th. We want to try and flush out the issues as best as we can. George, we were just talking, if I uh, can follow up on, on something we talked about just before the break, the role, for example, of the Firefighters Union, uh, for mm -hmm. which you worked Certainly. for many years. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the, working with the Firefighters Union locally, we created a wellness center for our public safety workers. And, and that was designed to try to make sure that there was constant uh, uh, medical care available to our public safety workers and to, and to really put an emphasis on preventative care. Last year, that wellness center caught six cases of prostate cancer very early. That's six lives potentially saved, and that's six people who will, after treatment, be able to go back to work with productive lives. Um, that's the kind of creative, uh, I think, uh, relationship you want to have between management and labor, between government and the unions uh, that represent our workers. And the uh, firefighters are, are perhaps one of the best examples of that kind of creative and productive relationship. Many people don't understand, but union issues go, that's why they talk about working families. They go far beyond just wages oh, yeah. and working conditions. Uh, benefits and, and health are major, major issues. I mean, let's just look at it today. Uh, you know, I'm lucky enough, thanks to the firefighters, that I have a pension. But many of uh, our children uh, will end up in jobs where they will, well, they'll have a 401k, they'll have something else, uh, but they won't have the kind of promise at the end of their work life that has existed certainly for decades now mm -hmm. in the American system and still exists in many other European systems uh, and other, other uh, retirement systems around the world. And I worry about that. I worry about the whole health care issue. Sure, exactly. Health care is offered a lot less, and I do want to get into that. But the phones are ringing off the hook. We have Ted from Burke. Ted, are you there? Yes, I am. I have an environmental question to ask Chairman Conley, please. Go ahead. Chairman Conley, most people are familiar with your Cool Counties program and initiative. How would you translate this program on a federal level? Um, I, uh, Last, last March, a year ago, uh, March, I uh, started something called Cool Counties, which was uh, to create an environmental framework of action whereby Fairfax and other counties around the United States could come up with a plan of action to reduce their carbon footprint and thereby reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it includes everything from switching to more wind power, uh, looking at hybrid vehicles, expanding a tree canopy, going to green buildings, all of our new buildings and renovated buildings in Fairfax, for example, we're committed to making LEED certified green buildings. Uh, a whole bunch of actions that can really make a difference in your carbon footprint. We then put that together and actually sort of took it on the road and encouraged other counties across the United States to do what we're doing. And we worked with the National Sierra Club in that project. Uh, when we un un unveiled this program back in July of last year, uh, we had about 25 counties uh, who eventually signed on, representing somewhere between 35 and 40 million Americans. So we're off to the races in trying to uh, create something at the local level. The reason we had to do this at the local level, however, was because the Bush administration uh, has been dragging its, feel, its, its heels on this very subject. In fact, it's still into denial about the science of global warming. Um, I would hope that, that at the federal level, in direct answer to the questioner's call, um, I, we, would, we would turn that around. It's time that the federal government embrace the fact of global warming and start an action plan before it's too late to try to turn around the carbon footprint of the United States and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we're emitting. And by the way, you can do this in a way that actually is cost saving. You can do this in a way that actually saves taxpayers money. Uh, that's certainly the model we're using here in Fairfax County, and I believe we can do that at the federal level, must do that at the federal level as well. While we're on the environment and the like, um, do you think that we still have that? There are some scientists who say it's too late on global warming. Uh, there are others that say if we start working now and we get some international cooperation, 
that we can turn this thing around before it's too late. Yeah, I, 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 well, I'm one who always believes the glass is at least half full. Um, and I, I don't believe it's too late. Um, I believe that, I believe that um, in effective collective action, that each one of us can make a difference. And collectively, if we're all making that difference, we can change the national footprint. Uh, we can even change the global footprint. We do know that some percentage, a very significant percentage, of the buildup of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere and, and other greenhouse gas, em gas emissions um, is due to human activity. And if we can moderate that human activity and reduce the amount of those emissions, uh, it, it, it is positive for the environment and over time can actually probably halt the advance of global warming, and if not eventually re you know, reverse it. Uh, but certainly, I think most science would suggest we've got a window of opportunity in which to try to make a difference whereby we can stabilize the situation and start to turn it around. And I think we have no choice but to do that for the sake of our children and for future generations. No doubt. Um, let's talk about health care a little bit. Um, how are we going to solve this? We are the only industrialized nation in the world um, that doesn't offer some form of health care to its citizens. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the European countries do. Uh, you know, that regardless of how they do it, they offer, Canada does, uh, they offer health care. How are we going to deal with 44 million Americans who are not covered? Including, you know, one of my own children who's just his job doesn't have it yet. And until he gets a job that does, uh, he's got to take his chances. Right. You know, I believe that, we ha that the health care system in the United States is broken because so many people can't access it. Um, if, you, you know, if you're healthy and you can afford health care, you're going to get some of the best health care in, in the world. Um, and, and we don't want to change the quality of health care uh, at the upper end, but we've we got to make sure that everybody has access to affordable health care. Um, and th as you say, 44 to 47 million Americans mm -hmm. do not. Well, that would suggest we've got a big problem. In, in the United States. That's a lot of people. Um, and, and frankly, that they end up having to access the health care system often at its most expensive, the emergency room. Correct. Uh, they're not getting the preventive health care they need. We need a plan that puts an emphasis on preventive health care uh, that, that finds a way to universalize access to health care. Now, there are a lot of plans on the table. Um, I'm intrigued by one put up by Senator Ron Wyden uh, from Oregon. And there's a companion bill in the House uh, to match his bill um, that actually would replace the current system of employer provided or paid health care for uh, a sort of insur a universal insurance, premium insurance access for everybody. And, and subsidizing that by using savings from Medicaid and from the SGIP program for kids, for example, uh, which neither of which would any longer be needed if you went to universal health care. Um, we also need to make sure that health insurance companies can't cherry pick anymore. Uh, right now, a lot of insurance companies, to make sure that they bring down their exposure, won't cover you if you've got a previously mm -hmm. existing medical condition. Well, that's precisely why you need health care and why you need to access the system. So there's a lot that's broken with the health care system that needs to be fixed. It's not an impossible task, but it is, it's going to require people to roll up their sleeves and be willing to work with each other, including across the aisle, uh, to create a better health care system that's more affordable and accessible for average Americans. You know, some people, uh, and I think they're wrong, go out and attempt to blame employers for this. But a lot of small businesses are reeling from the cost of their health insurance Absolutely. premiums for their employees as much as individuals are. It's, it's perhaps one of the largest single spiraling costs in both the private and public sector, because in the public sector, the government also has a problem uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to continue to afford the premiums for its workforce. All right, let's get on to an issue that I'm sure our viewers want to know about, and that is the war, or as some would call it, the occupation. How do we get out of it? How did we get in it, and how do we get out? Well, you know, we got into Iraq, uh, sadly, because uh, President Bush and uh, his advisors and the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Cheney, decided in advance that we needed to you know, take out Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam Hussein was a bad man. There's no question about that. Although the world has got more than its fair share of bad men uh, leading countries, and we don't topple every one of their regimes. Um, I think there was no thought given or no careful thought given to how, how, how do we do that and what replaces him? 
the likely replacement anyone could have told you before the invasion five years ago was it will be replaced by a theocratic Shia mm -hmm. regime. And I thought the United States thought that was not in our interest. Um, and so we learned that in Iran. We learned that in Iran. We made a lot of fundamental mistakes, not putting in enough troops, which was a direct result of uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, telling General Tommy Franks at the time, who was planning the war, he didn't want to put that many troops in. Well, we could topple Hussein, but we didn't have enough troops to police the situation, to restore law and order. Uh, and there was widespread looting as a result, and we stood by and watched it happen because we didn't have the troops to do anything about it. We debathicized the country, firing anyone who was a member of the Ba'ath Party, which meant that we were uh, really uh, inflating the ranks of the discontented, including, including terrorists. Uh, and then we disbanded the entire army after, uh, after we had indicated we weren't going to do that. I would take off the top, but we were going to leave the rank and file as a force for peace and order. We didn't do that, and they, now we had hundreds of thousands of, of people very unhappy with the United States, very unhappy with the new regime, who were armed. And, uh, and of course, what ensued was you know, enormous uh, chaos, violence of an unprecedented nature, uh, and our men and women in the middle of it. Uh, we have to disengage from that. Uh, we have to find an orderly way to extricate ourselves from that war. Um, I certainly do not support that war and believe that that's what we have to do. Uh, let us get replaced with some kind of international peacekeeping force. But that will require a different administration and a different president because this president doesn't have the credibility to bring anybody else to the table. Um, our allies don't trust us right now and for, and, and for good reason with respect to President Bush and his administration. Um, and, and we're going to have to get on with that business of peacekeeping in a very troubled part of the world and to try to repair a lot of the damage and wreckage left uh, behind in President Bush's wake. I think it'll be some of the wreckage I don't think we can ever repair. You know, there are uh, many middle class people living who are living li middle class existences in Baghdad and other communities in Iraq who now live like refugees. I mean, mm -hmm. whether they're not getting electricity, they're not getting water sometimes, they're, they're not getting basic services, they're in fear of their lives when they leave their homes, and their whole lives have changed. I don't think we'll ever be able to resolve all of that, besides all the American families who've seen their sons and daughters, husbands and wives uh, killed, and uh, the tens upon tens of thousands of American troops that are coming back with severe injuries that we've never seen the likes of uh, and survivors in any other war in our history. And that's part two of this, too, uh, George. It is, a, it is scandalous, the quality of the health care that has been provided to our brave men and women who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan as veterans. Some of the wounds are horrible because of the IEDs, the mm -hmm. uh, explosive devices that have been used in, in those uh, battlefronts. We have a sacred obligation, it seems to me, to make sure that the men and women who come back who need health care services and, and any other kind of services must get them. That's, that's a sacred obligation of this country to those men and women. And I certainly think the next Congress and hopefully the next Democratic administration uh, make good on that pledge. The folks at the post-traumatic stress, you know, that I don't think we're dealing appropriately with that at all. Uh, we have to take a break. Uh, we'll be back in two minutes. I hope you hang on. We have a couple of calls waiting and we'll take them right after the break. Uh, thank you again for watching. Uh, you're watching Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm George Burke. My guest is Jerry Connolly, Democrat candidate for, Democratic candidate for Congress. I don't want to sound One like a Republican. Day, I forgot to throw away my trash after lunch, but then I saw it later when I was playing in the woods. The next week, I went boating with my grandpa and there it was. I tried to go swimming, but I couldn't because of my trash. And when I went fishing, well, you can guess what I caught that day. So now I always throw away my trash in the garbage can, where it belongs. One in eight Americans goes hungry. One idea helped change that. A community started a garden that blossomed into farmer's markets. One in six children lives in poverty. One group of women found an answer by opening a daycare center that their neighbors could afford. Today, 36 million Americans live in poverty. But one by one, people are helping themselves and each other to change the picture of poverty to one of hope. For easy ways you can help, visit povertyusa.org. 
Every year, 250,000 Americans are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. My fellow scientists and I are working on treatments and a cure for this deadly disease. Millions of lives are at stake. Alzheimer's disease affects one in three families. We're committed to uncovering the mystery of Alzheimer's. And we're not going to quit until the job is done. To find out more about Alzheimer's disease, call 1-800-437-2423. Only through research will a cure be found. Jay, don't forget your helmet. Will do. Not your bike helmet. Oh, OK. Hi. I'm James Thrash with the Washington Redskins. On the football field, a helmet is an important piece of equipment. I also wear another helmet that's just as important, a bike helmet. It's the most important piece of equipment you'll have the next time you're out on your bike. Wear yours and make sure your kids do too. Yes. Safety first with the skins. Now back to the Inside Scoop for James. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, George Burke. Welcome back. Uh, if you've just tuned in, my guest is Jerry Connolly. He's running as a... Uh, right now, it's a crowded field. We have three other... ...at the end of this month when we see who provides uh, the authorities with the appropriate number of petitions, etc., uh, to continue in this race and to be bona fide candidates. Uh, and then it'll be winnowed down to one on January, I'm sorry, June 10th, uh, when we have our Democratic primary here in the 11th District. I hope everybody will get out and vote that day. Jerry, welcome back. Thank you, uh, We have a call from Bill from Springfield. Bill, are you there? Yes, sir. What can we do for you today? Well, I'd like to talk to Mr. Conley about uh, his... Uh um, rate of spending during his tenure as supervisor and chairman, it's gone up five times the rate of inflation and population. Uh, in fact, it's the speediest climb in spending in 30 years in the county. And I can't show any evidence of any spending program that he's voted against, most recently with the threat of um, federal funding being removed from Dulles Rail. He voted with a few other members of the board to continue seeking financing for it. Um, Dulles Rail is, right now, if it's built, it'd be a cost of over 4000 per household in mm -hmm. Fairfax County. That's just not right. Uh, yeah, you take $1.5 billion divided by roughly 300 Democrat for the 11th Congressional District seat here in Virginia. 50,000 households. Well, why don't you give me a chance, Bill? I think you've made your point to respond. Okay, well, I just have one more point. Dulles Rail compared to the mixing bowl, which cost $700 million and serves 400,000 people a day currently, if you compare those numbers of what the expected use of Dulles Rail is, it would be over 50 times the cost per rider. And if even the feds feel queasy about funding this, don't you think it's time to give it up? No, I don't. Um... Go ahead, Joey. Sounds like you got you could spend half an hour answering this question. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I think the caller is maybe mixing apples and oranges. If we follow his logic, frankly, we should never invest in transit uh, because roads always will carry more throughput than will transit. And uh, I think that's just not the way to look at transportation. If you want to break up congestion, if you want to really make some progress. In, uh, in the nation's capital, which has the second worst congestion in the United States, we've got to create transportation choices for commuters. Uh, it, the automobile can't be the prime or only way we're able to get somewhere. And that's why transit is so important. Uh, transit in the Dulles Quarter. The Dulles Quarter is the largest employment and investment quarter in all of Northern Virginia and the second most important in the region. And uh, we can turn that 23.1 mile quarter into a transit oriented quarter where we change the patterns of growth and development and we change the commuting patterns. Uh, that's what was done in the uh, Boston Clarendon quarter and it worked beautifully. And frankly, a lot of that's been done pretty much with where the, the original 103.5 mile metro system in Maryland, Virginia and DC uh, has also produced. So no, I think it's a very worthwhile investment. Uh, and fortunately, uh, on a bipartisan basis, so does our congressional delegation. Uh, Senator John Warner and Senator Frank Wolf, as well as Congressman Moran and 
Congressman Davison and now Senator uh, Jim Webb have been staunch allies in trying to make to secure federal funding. Uh, the caller seemed to suggest that somehow this burden would fall on our taxpayers. Actually, the financing for this project has been uh, the state puts up about half of the funding, uh, the federal or 25% or of the funding, excuse me, the federal government puts up 50%, and our local uh, share comes from a special tax district on commercial entities. Not a dime of it comes from local taxpayers. Uh, so that burden isn't shared by the average taxpayer at all, and, and that's by design. But this is a critical investment, and our region will be uh, enormously uh, affected negatively uh, if we don't make this investment. And I'm a staunch supporter of it, uh, as was uh, go former Governor uh, Mark Warner, uh, as is the current Governor uh, Tim Kaine. And I hope we move forward with it. The, uh, the bill had, uh, this caller had made the, uh, his initial charge, which dealt with uh, uh, allegations of uh, spending. Mm. How would you, I'm sure you're going to get that question uh, additional times during the campaign. How would you address that? Well, actually, you know, Fairfax County um, you know, was very prudent in, in, in the years in which uh, assessments were uh, you know, increasing it by double digits every year. Uh, we actually didn't do what our neighbors did. We, we ratcheted down the tax rate from $1.23 to $0.89. Cents. Uh, while our neighbors are looking at 22 and 26 cent tax rate increases this year, at the most we're looking at two or three pennies in Fairfax County. Um, we have a AAA bond rating, which means Wall Street recognizes Fairfax County as a well-managed county. We were selected as the best managed county in the United States, number one. Uh, and we've won almost every other award in terms of financial management, budget presentation, being the number one digital county in the United States. I'm proud of that record. Uh, we've actually shown enormous, enormously prudent fiscal management uh, that has made us a benchmark county in the United States. So uh, I, don't, I don't think we've done at all what the caller suggested. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, we've been very careful uh, in making the investments we've made and, uh, and they've paid off. What have, the, what have those investments produced? We've produced one of the highest public school systems, uh, achieving public school systems in the country, including uh, all of our high schools being listed as the top 3% and Thomas Jefferson being listed this year as the number one high school in all of America. We have the lowest crime rate of the 50 largest jurisdictions in the United States. We have the highest graduation rate and lowest dropout rate of the 50 largest jurisdictions in the United States. We've produced something special in Fairfax County because we've made careful investments. That's a record I'm happy to run on. Let's talk about the 11th district to move into the broader picture again. Uh, there are several unique characteristics that the 11th district has and it only shares with a handful of other districts around the country. One is obviously the federal workforce, the number of people who work for the federal government or derive their incomes from uh, uh, organizations, companies, associations that work with the federal government. Two is our technology sector. As you move into the western part of Fairfax and, and further out into the western part of Northern Virginia, we have our own small version of Silicon Valley. Absolutely. I wouldn't even call it that small anymore. That's right. Uh, anybody who hasn't driven out the Dulles Toll Road in, in seven, eight, or ten years would be shocked to see the difference in terms and the names that are on those buildings that are located mm -hmm. uh, along that corridor. Uh, it's a who's who of technology. Um, does that uh, put special, uh, given the, the large federal workforce, given the big technology sector that we have here, does that put special demands on 11th District Congressman? I mean, certainly. It's no secret that one of the formulas that uh, Tom Davis, the incumbent, used was to attempt to take care of federal employees. Sometimes uh, we didn't agree necessarily that that's what he was doing, but that's certainly how he would spend it. Yeah, I, I think uh, the 11th Congressional District, you've got rec you to recognize the characteristics you've just enumerated. You know, we're not a uh, smokestack industry-based economy here. We're a knowledge-based economy. Uh, and technology is driving that along with federal procurement and outsourcing. And uh, we've got a very large federal workforce that needs to, you know, be tended. Um, uh, with respect to the federal workforce, you know, I think there are a lot of discrete issues they care a lot about that this con next congressperson has to work on their behalf. You know, federal outsourcing policies, pay parity between civilian and military employees, uh, big issues. 
showing the respect of the federal workforce, uh, promotion of telework opportunities, in the, uh, which could make a big difference in our congestion, and frankly, productivity within the federal government. The federal government has been uh, laggard when it comes to uh, making those opportunities available to its workforce. Um, in terms of the technology sector, you know, uh, uh, the internet is a big part of our economy here in Fairfax County. Uh, technology companies have blossomed. Uh, if, you've looked at the, if you look at what happened to our economy uh, in the recovery from the last big recession of 1990, you know, we've taken off on a trajectory like this in terms of economic growth. Fairfax County now has, for example, 600,000 jobs, many of them in the technology sector or other sectors related to that technology business. Uh, we, need to, we need to make sure that the next congressperson is familiar with that industry. I happen to work for a technology company, for example, uh, and, and is going to be sympathetic to the needs of that workforce as well. Uh, it, it, it's a different kind of congressional district than so many others across the United States with a different set of challenges and opportunities. We are at that time where we're nearing the end of the program. We've got about two minutes left. I'm going to give you one minute, as I try to do with every candidate. I'm actually short cheating you a little bit. But tell them why they should vote for you. Speak directly to the voters. You know, I've spent the last uh, 13 and a half years uh, on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and the last almost five now as its chairman. I've uh, provided regional leadership in Northern Virginia. I've shown how by bringing people together we can get things done. I demand that government produce results. And I think that ethic, that demand, ought to be imposed in the federal government as well. We should expect no less from our federal government than we expect from our local governments here in Northern Virginia. It ought to work. Um, and it hasn't in the last seven years in some tragic ways. I also bring to the table extensive foreign policy background that no other candidate in this race does. I've traveled to 76 countries. I worked for the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee for 10 years. I specialized in the Middle East and foreign assistance issues. Um, that expertise combined with my local government experience um, I think is a unique combination that can really serve the 11th Congressional District well and hopefully can add a little bit to the uh, to, the, to the next Congress, uh, which is going to hopefully be working with a, a new Democratic president to try to undo the damage and the breakage of, the, of these uh, Bush administration years. Uh, the last seven years have produced a dysfunctional federal government and have done real damage to the United States' reputation and credibility overseas. We need to make sure that we tackle both of those challenges and reverse the damage done these last seven years. Jerry. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, uh, George. No one can suggest it wasn't certainly an informative program. Uh, I hope to have you back before this uh, campaign is over. To our viewers, I thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week with Inside Scoop Virginia. Good night, and have a nice week.